Good day, everyone. My name is Kayla Johnston, and I am the Supervisor of Education, Outreach, and Public Programming at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And here I will be our host for this NCTR dialogue on the land back movement and what that means or potentially doesn't mean when we reflect upon that around the idea of truth and reconciliation. So the question for my audience is, is what does land back mean to you? Of course, over the next 90 minutes, we hope to put some context to those words. Today, we are joined by two wonderful guests who have some views on what the land back movement means to them. Joining us from Yellowknife, we have Clayton Thomas Mueller. And joining from Kingston, Ontario is Tina Monroe. Now, before we jump into that big question, I first would like to ask each to introduce themselves. Clayton, I'll, I'll go with you first if you'd like to give a, a brief introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tanse, uh, bonjour. Uh, Zongi bini si yonene tish nikas kinuto dem. As mentioned, my uh, English name is Clayton. I'm a Cree man from Pugatawagan Cree Nation in northern Manitoba. It's the easternmost Treaty 6 uh, First Nation. And um, yeah, I, I live in the city of Winnipeg uh, in Treaty 1 and um, uh, home of the Métis Nation. And uh, but I'm talking to you all today uh, for this wonderful panel. Um, you know, big shout out to uh, NCTR for um, you know creating this basket uh, for us to come together to talk about such an important issue uh, of land back in in, in, context, in the context of truth and reconciliation. Um, but I'm 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 way up north right now in um, in Dera, uh, Yellowknife, uh, Dene territory for. Uh, for an Arctic Indigenous youth gathering and um, doing cultural events and uh, screening my film and some stuff related to my book, Life in the City of Dirty Water, here all week. So I'm really thankful and happy to be here to speak with you all today. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that introduction. And Tina, I'm going to pass the virtual mic to you to give an introduction of your own. Hi, everyone. Bonjour. Um, my name is Tina Monroe. I am an Anishinaabe woman. I was born in the city of Thunder Bay, but my family is from an area called Greenbush, Saskatchewan. It's kind of by um, Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan area. Um, like Kayla mentioned, I'm in Kingston right now. Uh, um, I'm actually a student at Queen's University. I'm thinking about these ideas of land back and what it means to have your land and life back. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to these conversations. Clayton and I actually spent a lot of time together last year snowshoeing when I was listening to your book. So it's nice to actually be in a dialogue now where I can say something back to you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I guess that's the thing with podcasts or audiobooks is we get the one way listening and it's so often we want to answer back. So I'm glad we're able to give that opportunity for that dialogue a little later in our program today. So I wanted to remind everyone who's joining us that we are going to be doing about 20 minutes each for each speaker and then a panel, and then we open it up for Q&A questions from the audience. So as we go through the discussion, please feel free to post your questions and thoughts into the chat, whether you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. And at the end, we'll wrap around to take a look at some of those questions and put them up on screen. So with that, the first thing I wanted to touch upon, you know, the land back movement, those words can mean different things depending on who's saying them. Sometimes it means restoration of land ownership. It could mean the protection or stewardship of Mother Earth, or it could mean land claims and self-government agreements. Now, one thing is for certain, and that is we want to reconnect with the land. So that begs the question, the great big question, what does land back actually mean? Now, originally we we're gonna have uh, Tina jump on first, but we're in discussions. We actually wanted to open up first with Clayton. And that is kind of my big, uh, big question for you before we jump into some smaller ones is, what does this movement or, or land back this concept idea mean to you? Well, that is the question of the day. Um, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been traveling um, since the pandemic uh, restrictions have been lifted um and and doing talks across the country uh, as part of a national book tour uh for my memoir life in the city of dirty water and um you know all of these events have been centered around the sixty thousand foot question what is it going to actually take for us all you know in these lands that they call canada 
to move through and heal from the violence of colonialism. And, you know, the conversations have been really intense, full of emotion, um, but also really powerful and healing. And, you know, as a father, I've been really moved, uh, especially when other Native fathers come to me after the event and we can just have real check-ins about the challenges that we face, you know, in this modern time. And, you know, I, I, I've been a campaigner, uh, an elite global campaigner for the last two decades, my entire adult life. Um, you know, I've, I, I've been at, I was asked to step forward and to hold um, the extractive industries um, that have been disproportionately targeting our native homelands uh, to become batteries, um, you know, for unsustainable cities and um, for the global economy. Um, in terms of raw resources that are being extracted from our homelands, water, um, minerals, oil and gas, timber, you know, fish, even our own bodies as indigenous peoples are being extracted um, in this modern uh, economic context um, of the settler colonial state of Canada. And this country's economic paradigm of capitalism and neoliberalism uh, hyper neoliberalism is fundamentally and inextricably linked for its success to the ongoing suppression of indigenous people's collective rights to the dis uh, 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 um, possession of our peoples from our homelands um, to move to cities to you know not experience the 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 mobility of rights guaranteed to Canadians and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms when it comes to our inherent rights, especially to harvest, hunt, fish, and trap, um, or to, you know, harvest resources for our own economic uh, benefits and under our sovereignty and self-determination. The government of Canada continues to violate treaty agreements, our inherent rights, which are enshrined in Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution and backed up by powerful international legal instruments like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and like the ILO um, 169, um, you know, all of these things, you know, uh, articulate very clearly that Indigenous peoples have the right to sovereignty and self-determination, uh, the right to not be molested by settler colonial states like Canada and the United States, Australia, uh, Scandinavian countries, all the places across Mother Earth where we live. But here in Canada, the federal government, you know, um, they like to show up at the United Nations and to, you know, and we have to rely on them because even to this day, even though we have the right to sovereignty and self-determination, we still don't have a seat at the table at the UN. And so we have to rely on, 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 on paternalistic and white supremacist settler colonial states like Canada to be our champions at that level. And so when they show up, you know, when Justin Trudeau shows up at the UN Climate Summit and, and, and announces, um, you know, in a rather unhumble way that Canada is back and they're a climate leader and they're a champion of indigenous rights, but then they come back home and they buy the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline for you know, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, um, you know, there's some pretty big contradictions there, and so you know, I see a lot of young people um, in the work that I've been doing, you know, fighting against the extractive industry sector, in particular, fighting against the expansion of the Alberta tar sands and its associated pipelines. You know, many of you have probably seen it in the news as of late. There's a big gathering up here in Dene territory about the spillage that has been coming out of the vast network of to toxic tailings waste ponds in and around Fort McMurray and Fort Mackay Cree Nation in Northern Alberta. Um, millions and millions of liters of toxic affluent with all kinds of heavy metals, um, you know, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, you know, uh, neurotoxins, um, you know, from the recycled water they use to process tar sands that's being extracted from Dene, Cree, and Métis territory. You know, the biological contamination um, 
um, at a massive bioregional scale that is happening in a place that represents probably a third of the fresh water available on Mother Earth um, is absolutely terrifying. And the consequences that our Native people play pay in regards to not just being impacted disproportionately by the by the the, the a rapidly destabilizing climate and an increase in violent, unpredictable climate weather related events. Um, we're also impacted by those industries that are driving climate change because of the proximity of these industries to our communities and to our food and water sources. And so, you know, when we talk about land back and when we hear, especially, you know, those that are the tip of the spear of social movements uh, of indigenous peoples fighting for sovereignty and self-determination. You know, it's youth and it's women, you know, who carry the disproportionate weight, uh, the disproportionate work um, and the disproportionate emotional labor um, when it comes to the current circumstance. And there's a lot of righteous anger um, and frustration um, that not just women and youth uh, from our communities are experiencing and expressing through the land back social movement. Um, but, you know, there, there is a lot of, uh, you know, it's very justified um, because of the ongoing contradictions and hollow apologies and lack of tangible and meaningful actions to level the playing field between Canada's most marginalized population and the rest of the country as we deal with the existential threat of climate change, of pandemic, and especially of the emergence of probably what's going to be the most devastating economic recession globally that human beings have ever faced. And so, you know, all the while, you know, this has been a hard year to be a native person in this country, you know, with Kamloops 2015, and those unmarked graves, you know, well over 10,000 now, with the numbers only to increase as ground penetrating radar investigations continue that the over 130 residential schools, violence in our communities, which is directly tied to the government's austerity agenda, the liberal Trudeau government, you know, they're making it so bad on the reserve that our people are, you know, poverty, cash poorness, you know, it breeds violence, it breeds terrible things. And we see that in incidences like what happened in James Smith Cree Nation this year. And then, you know, of course, the Pope coming in the midst of all of that, it really created a lot of divisive discourse and debate within the Native community because a lot of people, including my late Gigi, you know, the residential school survivors, but they, they you know, they're still Catholic, you know? And so it was very meaningful to them that the Pope came to apologize. But for young people, especially, I find, I observed that it pissed us off, you know, like it was like, you know, screw you, Pope. We don't care what you have to say. You know, we want our land back. The Vatican is one of the biggest holders of land here in Canada and across the world over. They're one of the richest organizations there is. They're their own country. They're their own nation state right there in the city of Rome, the Holy See, they call it. You know, and if the Pope was serious uh, about reconciliation and the truth, the Vatican would return all of the land that they have in their holdings to the rightful indigenous nations that those lands belong to, you know, return those, those deeds of assumed title. And I think that it's bigger than just the Vatican or the Pope, you know, all of that, emotion and events this year, you know, it culminated in the death of the monarch of Queen Elizabeth, which would cause complete erasure of all of these important issues that Canadians need to learn about in, 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 in combating against a well-funded decades old campaign that tells people that natives are a drain on the taxpayer. Okay. That natives get free everything when it is actually the exact opposite. Indigenous peoples have been subsidizing the wealth of Westerners uh, in our lands since before the inception of the settler colonial state of Canada. Because of white supremacy and um, because of the papal bulls and the doctrines of discovery, you know, 
settlers, uh, 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 you know, they, 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 they've been able to accumulate a lot of wealth, you know, which is passed down through inheritance to their families through generations. You know, Native people weren't even allowed to leave the res until the 60s, let alone vote, let alone have a bank account, let alone start a business or own property. Um, and so there is a righteous rage, I believe, you know, um, because Canada is a corporation, you know, and, and, and because of the fact in their very racist, you know, apartheid, white supremacist sort of way, you know, they hold all of Indigenous, all of Canada is Native land, okay, whether it's Inuit, First Nations, Métis, you know, everyone in between. And whenever that Canada needs to get a loan from an international private sector financing institution or public institution like the world, well, not the World Bank, but, you know, a lot of these institutions, um, you know, they get as much, they can, they can borrow money down anytime they want because they hold our land in trust, okay? Canada's whole street credit in the G8 gang of climate gangsters is based on the fact that they are profiting, you know, that they're using our land, our resources, our climate, our bodies that we know aren't actually ours. We just take care of them. They use that to become one of the richest economies on the planet. And Canada tries to sell itself as an energy powerhouse, a superpower, you know, that when in reality, all Canada is, is a resource colony to military superpowers like China like the United States, our biggest trading partner through NAFTA, and like the European Union through our free trade agreement with them. And there are many other regional free trade agreements that are that Canada is negotiating. And when they negotiate those things, they have to fill out a credit application. And part of the credit application is, are you acting in good faith to your fiduciary and legal obligation to Indigenous peoples, the rightful title holders, of the lands and waters in the borders of Canada. And Canada always says, oh yeah, for sure we are, you know? But it's all a, a fagazi, it's a lie, right? And so it's a complex and very nuanced conversation that we're addressing here today. When we talk about land back, I believe that it is fundamentally a part of truth and reconciliation. I believe that, you know, if, if Canada doesn't get the implementation of the 94 recommendations of the TRC right, um, we're gonna, you know, even through the decarbonization of our economy and the reorganizing of our economy, you know, in response to the existential threat of climate change, we will continue to see the same kind of land fights and the same tension, the same toxic environment, um, just with wind turbines um, or, or solar farms or geothermal development um, or the mining of rare earth minerals for the production of photovoltaics and other battery storage devices that are you know, required for the new energy economy. And indigenous peoples will continue to pay a disproportionate price for this if we don't ensure that indigenous peoples are leading the charge when it comes to the great transition that we're going through right now. You know, the fact is, is that the global, there is a global scientific consensus on the fact that we've only got 10 years to decarbonize our economy, to stave off the worst impacts of climate change. And they announced that five years ago. And so we have five years to turn off the tap. And meanwhile, the Canadian government has just approved a 300 uh, million uh, barrel per day or a ton. I, I don't re remember the measurements, but a massive LNG facility in Kitimat, uh, you know, which ironically is owned by the local uh, First Nation. Um, Canada is still pursuing the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which costs have ballooned more. You know, they spent enough money now on the on the, trans, on the um, trans Mountain Pipeline to pay for 10 years of universal mental health care for all Canadians. That's how much they spent on this climate carbon bomb, which is going to cross thousands of salmon producing rivers and streams in 
so-called British Columbia. And, you know, it's the same story right across the country. You know, whether it's hydroelectric, you know, the Renaissance with hydroelectric development or with um, mining, you know, high carbon intensive industries. You know, people think mega hydro is a climate friendly energy source, but it is the number one source of methane emissions, according to the government's own federal agencies. A, a greenhouse gas 29 times more potent than CO2. And so, and, you know, and Canada is still cutting down all the trees in the boreal forest and in the Great Bear Rainforest, critical carbon sinks uh, on a planetary scale in the, in the fight against climate change, critical ecosystems for our people and the intact fishing economies that still exist in those territories. You know, I have a big dream about reconciliation, you know, and truth, you know, I, I dream that that in my lifetime, that the dams that destroyed the highways of my people, that they would get decommissioned because the crown corporations like Manitoba Hydro will, you know, they're building new dams, not because we need that cheap hydroelectricity. They're building it because they want to be the next tar sands. They want to be the next Exxon Shell. They want to, you know, charge up all the EV charging stations across the country and continent that are being built in response to the forced technology transfer of public and private fleets from fossil fuel combustion engines to EVs. And I believe that, you know, as part of reparations for colonization, part of reparations for destroying our rivers and our fishing economies, that those EV charging stations should be owned by First Nations in the spirit and intent of the treaties of truth and reconciliation. Because that's forever money. That is money as long as the sun shine. Because those EV stations can run off of photovoltaics that are, you know, built by First Nations peoples. You know, and we already own the biggest solar farm in Manitoba where I live. You know, Fisher, uh, uh, Fisher, Fisher Cree First Nation has the biggest photovoltaic installation. And it's the same story in Alberta. Athabasca Chippewa Dene Nation is the biggest, you know, owns the biggest solar array in that province. The biggest challenge that we have right now is that we have to, you know, share our stories. We have to unlock the potential in every single human being, not just our native people, certainly not just the youth and women that are leading our movements, but all Canadians um, to become politicized on this issue um, and to understand that land back is not a bad thing. You know, I'll leave you with this example and then I look forward to hearing Tina and, and, and to Q&A. But you look at what happened in North Vancouver, the most valuable real estate in, some of the most valuable real estate on planet Earth, in the Squamish territory. There was a 99 year lease that settlers had with Squamish Nation and they built billion dollar condos and malls and you know mansions all there by the Lionsgate Bridge in, in North Van and the lease ran out a couple years ago and the white people freaked they're like oh my god the natives are coming they're gonna send us back to Europe oh and and Squamish was like yo this ain't no thing you're just gonna pay us taxes now shit we'll take care of the roads we'll take care of your mall you know it's all good and now Squamish just announced thousands of new housing units that are being added to a city that has a housing crisis. And there's components of social housing built into their housing development, unlike the greedy capitalist developers that have been developing the rest of the city. And we will see more and more case studies like this happen, where if Canada and the provinces and the territories and municipalities stop molesting Indigenous peoples and meddling with our sovereignty and right to self-determination, the entire country will thrive and we will contribute meaningfully to the global fight against the existential threat of climate change. And mental health wise and spirituality wise, we're all gonna do a hell of a lot better. 
Thank you, Clayton, so much for sharing. That was a very insightful response to my one question, which is great because all my supplementary questions are now going to end up in our, our dialogue and back and forth because there's so many pieces I wanted to kind of add and pepper in. But before we move to Tina, I thought I'd just kind of share some of my own thoughts. Uh, the piece talking about that righteous anger, the justified anger, speaks to me so much, especially looking at, you know, Sean Carlton's work here out of the U of M where he talked about you know, mainly residential school denialism and the common arguments that come out. And there is a demand from non-Indigenous communities that Indigenous people act civilly or, or bring this, um, you know, balanced view that any Indigenous emotion, whether sadness, anger, outrage, is, is too much to be handled, whether while we're giving platforms for non-Indigenous peoples to, to say things like there is an Indigenous fake news industry and the unmarked graves are the biggest, you know, fake news story to come about. And it, it really speaks to a lot of those barriers I see when it comes to reconciliation. Some of the reports that I, I really like or are kind of keen into are, are from the um, Yellowhead Institute, you know, identifying, you know, everything from policymakers and this paternalistic attitude of we know best, setting Indigenous agency and expertise off to one side when we have those solutions to the problems they created to, you know, fostering, you know, anti-Indigenous, um, or I should say racism, structural racism, to these empty promises, to the lack of care. And, and the big one is this idea of reconciliation being used as a vehicle to manage reputations or the perspective of government and agencies. And then how can we expect communities to, I guess, really buy into reconciliation when we're so focused on survival due to the destruction of the land, due to the structures and policies that exist? And so for me, you answered all, all the questions I have in my collection here. So I thank you for that. And I just wanted to pepper in my own thoughts before turning to Tina here and really asking you that same big question here. What, what does that land back movement mean to you? And we discussed a few different things. And then the one that I'll kind of pepper in there is this, what does it mean to get your life back? What, what is that? Yeah, thanks, Kayla. Thank you, Clayton. Um, so many times I want to pop in there, but um, I'll wait for our discussion after. Um, yeah, so I think a lot about uh, land back. I we always do. I think um, I came into consciousness during the Edel No More. I remember working at a food court in Thunder Bay, and there was drumming in the in the mud, and know what's going on. But at that time, I mean, I'm, I'm a non-status person, meaning that my family does not belong to registered First Nation. Um, my mother was born in a bush in a shack, but they weren't registered as children under the Act as having status, so to avoid sending their children to residential schools. So what that meant was that we weren't on the reserve, but we were too, for, too poor rather to live in the city or in the town of Hudson Bay or Prairie River. Um, so my family lived on the margins and um, lived poorly. Um, my mom ran away and she was 14 and came to the city and did what a lot of indigenous people do when we first come to the city without any kind of street smarts is you do what you do, you have to do to survive. Um, and so I think in this kind of survival economy, um, it's kind of hard to think about these really larger ideas because your needs are so much more immediate. Um, in my master's research, I was working on a project that asked um, what would happen if a library decolonized? Because we hear about these mandates about decolonization, and reconciliation. These things are thrown around so much, especially at the institutional level, that we don't even know what they're actually really meaning. I mean, like we can get like an indigenous section in a library or we can build. I just walked by Queens is building a, a lodge for indigenous people for indigenous gatherings. And these things are great. But what does that do for the person when they go home from these events and after the budget's spent and after it's maintained and who takes care of the medicine garden at the waterfront when it's planted? And yeah, so I think a lot about life back. So um, this library was talking about decolonization and a good friend of mine had asked like, well, if you're going to decolonize, are you going to give your land back? And then so this project looked at that. And so I was doing some interviews with some community members and asking them their thoughts on what would happen. And the first thing that came to mind was that the land should go back to Fort William First Nation or a neighboring First Nation around Thunder Bay. So we were meeting in the library. This was before the pandemic. Um, I remember I went to the bathroom and um, if anyone is familiar with public libraries, they're not the public libraries of our youth anymore. They're much more dynamic. And so while I was there, there was a street person who was using the bathroom as a safe injection site and they were indigenous. And so I think about 
you know, if we give this library back, where does this person go for water or for warmth or for shelter or to, for, to safely inject or for community or accountability? Say you need to use your phone or to charge your wheelchair. Like, where do these people go? And I think like my motivation with solving this or thinking about thinking through this was thinking about, um, you know, like the person in the bathroom is my family also. Like, that's my mother trying to make her way in the city. Right. So I think like if we were to displace these people in the name of decolonization, would that not only replicate the logic of colonialism? And an answer I got back was like, well, I'm sure the First Asian would still share the land with people. And it's like, well, yeah, but I feel like it's also like a complicated thing too, because um, it's still property either way. All land still belongs to the crown, even if it's in different custodianship, if it's uh, crown land, if it's like a reserve, it's still land held by the crown. And even though we own property, we still pay taxes because ultimately it's all the crown. We're paying for the permission to have the land, even though we do pay for it, it's title. So I started to think about um, the ways that indigenous people use land in the city and the library is, um, is one of them. So I used to think about how my mother and I used to get around town together. I grew up um, poor, my mom was on welfare. Um, my father was killed when I was a child. So it was just the two of us and we were kind of navigating this really hostile system. If anybody is familiar with um, the Thunder Bay podcast or any news in the past five years from Thunder Bay, you're familiar with what kind of, um, troubled kind of complicated place that is to navigate, especially when you're limited resources. Um, so as a child, when we would go and visit these um, like soup kitchens or food banks or whatever, I noticed that it wasn't only brown poor people. <laughs> there's poor people of all different colors who were like using these in these places. And so I feel like there's a there's a, a very complex and beautiful society of the dispossessed that you kind of um, immerse yourself in and get connected with. And this is the kind of community that I was born into. So I started to think about the ways that we use land. So back to when I was a kid, sorry. Um, my mom used to take me um, to these little patches. Like I used to, I grew up listening to her tell stories about growing up in the prairies um, on the trap line with her, her grandpa, her, her and her grandpa were really close. Um, it's just, I don't know, picking frogs from the swamp or playing baseball or whatever kind of things they could do. Um, but I knew that they lived on a trap line. And even though I could never visit this place and I was never really close to my family, um, I would kind of imagine this kind of life in the present. So I kind of like thought about how uh, we would go visit like a patch of grass by the railroad tracks. Um, my mom, there was a tree there. Remember it was storming. My mom took me to go and put tobacco in this tree and taught me how to pray there. Even though it was by the railroad tracks, it's forgotten spot. And we used to go and scout people's backyards for um, uh, raspberry bushes and berry bushes. And if there was a huge lot, I would go to the door and I would knock and say, can we pick your berries? And um, there's a Saskatoon patch on the other end of town. We take the bus there and I would go there and learn how to pick berries. My mom would teach me anyway. But these little forgotten moments happened on either private property or city property. And they were still local, but I was still able to make connections to the land. Um, I think about how um, my family is not the only one doing these kind of things. So what other kinds of algorithms are people living in the city when they don't have any resources and don't have a reserve to return to or that they belong to? And even if they do return to one or are a member of a First Nation, like sometimes our relationships with our communities are so complicated that the roadmap back is so severed that um, any association with the kin that we did have there over time has been ruptured. Um, so I really think about how we reconcile with those realities in ourselves. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reliance on Eve Tuck's article or Eve Tuck and Kei Wen Yang's article on decolonization is not a metaphor where it calls for the repatriation of the indigenous land and life. But I really think it's the latter part of that that we kind of don't really pay too much attention to. Like, what does it mean to have your indigenous life back if you can't have land back? Like, what does it mean to find yourself and to reconcile yourself when you don't really even have any evidence of where your family has been? So how do you use your body to kind of navigate this world in a different way that makes sense to you and that you can kind of dig for your reconciliation daily? Um, yeah, I think sometimes these bigger, these big ideas, uh, they're so complex that it's hard to kind of, um, for us to sluice away or to kind of like sift something that's useful for us to kind of um, manifest in the daily today because these issues are so big. But I feel like, um, you know, Simpson talks about rebuilding our world every day. And I think that world building work, whatever that looks like for people um, can be different, but that's also part of the reconciliation. I think having family who, um, you know, grew up or lived on the margins, like I think um, I have a lot of alcoholism, there's suicide and 
uh, in my family. And I think about how what land back and reconciliation decolonization looks for people looks like for people who don't have access to uh, mental health things or um, what is increasingly becoming a more and more expensive good life. So sometimes I think a lot about um, complex personhood about how like maybe we're just not reading the circumstances um, for what they are like we kind of like read the circumstances of um, people marginalized folks according to a lexicon that's based on capitalist acquisition and um, status. So I think like, um, I don't know, being close with my own, I guess, reconciling with the truth of my family's history, it's helped me to really rethink addiction and how sometimes land back is better than yesterday because it's all you can afford. And sometimes the trauma that you're trying to run from is just so complicated that maybe alcohol is medicine. So I think like, you know, we want to burn the whole thing down, but I think we're trying to we can often overlook the desire that people are trying to meet where they are at too. And I think, um, yeah, so for me, I think land back is also includes a lot of um, supports for people who are street bound and don't have access to even the internet to learn about these things, right? <laughs> yeah. This last little put that you are sharing really kind of struck me with what's kind of the discussions that are happening here in Winnipeg or Manitoba regarding self or safe injection sites. So the, the provincial government has made a little bit of an about turn with this idea of providing um, licenses for these sites on what they could do, what services they could provide, etc. But again, we're looking at it from this perspective of abstinence as the best course of action without actually understanding what, why those safe injection sites are important or why it provides those services and how it is, although seen in a negative light, how it is um, providing a little bit of that safety net and support that communities need to potentially yeah, continue on living. And that's what kind of stood out for me. And for this last little bit, I, I was kind of wondering, you know, through this exploration of, I guess, can, can land back movement give back an identity that's been stolen or erased? Is that possible? For instance, you know, one question I had brought into mind, would we accept land back that has been irreparably damaged? Is that still of benefit to accept that, to hold that land, to use that land, even though it has been so processed, poisoned, what have you, and, and actually, I don't know, maybe is this the point in time we want to open it up to this back and forth? Get both your thoughts on that? I'll definitely start on it. I would love to hear Clayton's thoughts on it. Wonderful. Um, I do think like uh, it, in the city, I think it's um, it takes a lot in the imagination to try to imagine the land that exists beneath the concrete. Um, like Dion Brand talks about the civilization of the parking lot. And like, what is it like to be of the civilization beneath that? It takes a lot of imagination. So I think like, um, I don't know, I'm really grateful for my mom for showing me those kinds of things. But I think like if we're waiting for land to be returned, well, I remember listening to this podcast with Ryan McMahon and he was talking about um, we want the land back, we want it back well. I don't know if I, we can have that kind of like necessarily like stipulation on it. Like I feel like if my body is also land, would I not be wanted on that if I was whole and well also? Like, and I think um, our treaty relationship isn't with, you know, land as it was then or is now or is in the future it's just with land in general and all the ways and the complex ways that it manifests um i think if we think to our personal lives we're all complex people and go through really complicated things and understand what it's like to rebuild ourselves and how much love and self-love that takes and i think extending that to our territories is really important in these considerations um <clears throat> I don't believe that the federal government or provincial or territorial governments hold title over our land. I think that that's their interpretation of the relationship right now. But I know in my heart and in my mind that our people, our leadership have specifically not engaged in a deep way in the Supreme Court over treaty rights and inherent rights in the way that our relations have with the US district courts, um, you know, in the 40s and 50s, where horrific precedences were established over Indian law and the fiduciary and legal trust relationship between tribes and the United States of America. 
Um, I think that both sides here in Canada have kept it super vague. And that's why they don't come in and just shoot us when they're trying to steal our land. Okay. And, and, you know, and unfortunately with the way that it works in our common law system is that the burden of proof is on the plaintiff. And so, you know, our native nations get stuck in these tens of millions of dollars lawsuits, um, you know, fighting against um, the encroachment of extractive industries into our territories, the privatization interests over things like water. Um, and, and, and so, you know, and, and, and there is a, a dirty, dirty boxing game that the settler colonial state plays in the legal gray area that exists in the passing of the buck between the provinces, territories and the feds when it comes to jurisdiction over natural resources and indigenous peoples and um, the fiduciary and legal obligations um, that, 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 that are on, on the side of the settlers. And, you know, we have to remember that the original spirit and intention of treaties and agreements between, you know, the very diverse, um, you know, groups of indigenous peoples across these lands they call Canada and the crown um, that, you know, I, I think uh, Wabanakwit Canoe said it best when he was a broadcaster, you know, he, he described the, the Haudenosaunee two-row wampum treaty. And he said, you know, it's, it's two canoes in the river heading in the same direction and not interfering with each other's paths. That's it. Okay. But Canada keeps fucking with our path. Like they keep molesting us and profiting off of it, and 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 taking their assumption of 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 authoritarian title over indigenous title to extremes. But we see with court cases in places where treaty has not been signed, like in the Chilcotin decision, for example, where indigenous peoples have utilized the very young and immature Western science to validate our oral history of our polyamorphic languages. Our stories have told us <clears throat> that there was a flood in the Chilcotin region thousands of years ago, and core sampling verified this story, which verified their accounts that they utilized all their lands and through their economic system and their understanding of ecology with their traditional ecological knowledge they moved in accordance with the way that the animals moved on their lands, with the seasons and the times for harvesting, the times for celebration, etc. And, you know, therefore, you know, the argument of the province of British Columbia of use it or lose it was a bunch of bullshit. Okay. And this goes right across the country, even in the treaty territories, you know, I often get into it with my relations in BC and other non-treaty areas of, of Canada when they say, we never signed away our treaty rights or our land. You know, neither did us treaty Indians. You know, the federal government assumes that we signed away title, uh, even though those treaties were signed utilizing gunboat diplomacy, utilizing starvation as a tactic. Uh, you know, these agreements were signed under duress. Um, but even still, there was tobacco burnt. There were fasts and water and food sacrificed. There were sun dances and flesh offerings. There were great offerings into the lakes and rivers and streams, of tobacco, cloth, beads, choice cuts of meat, berries, all to ensure that us right now, would have the power to be able to do what we're doing right now in terms of the land back movement, the implementation of the 94 recommendations of the TRC, and you know, leading the fight with our knowledge of our of our sacred circle of life or what they call the biosphere, our traditional ecological knowledge in the fight against climate change. And so, you know, it, I think the, you know, in response to Tina too, I really wanted to say there's a lot of, you know, our people doing the work of the colonizer these days, you know, the, the, the colonial mindset, you know, there's a lot of classism that exists in Indian country. 
you know, a lot of the work in my life is dedicated to reorganizing pipelines to prison, which exists for our people, to pathways to Sundance or other cultural rele relevant, you know, things that help our people heal and to be able to actually participate in the collective in a healthy way. But to even get to those ceremonies is very expensive. You know, tobacco is very expensive. You know, gas is very expensive. And Indians be hella snobby these days, you know. You get some of these bougie Indians, and they're like, they, you know, they'll trip out on a native if they had a drink the night before, or they smoke a joint, if they try to come to ceremony for healing, you know. And they use protocol to create boundaries. When there's no mental health infrastructure in the cities, you know, to get our people, you know, who are, are affected by the meth epidemic, you know, who are affected by the fentanyl epidemic. You know, these people need serious, serious uh, mental health supports and intervention just so that they have the, 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 the spiritual and emotional capability to even go and fast or sit through a sweat lodge or go to a Sundance, you know? And so, as I mentioned, this government has spent enough money money already on the Trans Mountain Pipeline to pay for 10 years of universal mental health care. And, you know, when we look at post-traumatic stress disorder in the Native community, you know, and I, I'm part of that too, you know, both my parents went to residential school. I was the first one in my family not to go. And, you know, we all have this thing called in, intergenerational res, Indian residential school syndrome. And it's a very unique type of post-traumatic stress disorder. And the only kind of cognitive psycho-based therapy that's helped me not be a complete drug addict and alcoholic has been radical ERDM therapy, which is not covered by Indian Health Services. And it's $300 a session. Okay? And, you know, I, I believe that a part of reconciliation is that we got to turn the cart before the horse. So we got to talk about reparations. And part of reparations is that every Indian in this country should get multiple generation money and, 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 and infrastructure and supports, especially mental health, so that and, and never have to worry about, you know, things that people without money have, you know, worry about. Because we never get a chance to breathe, to be creative, to, to dream. Because as Tina talks about, you know, the austerity agenda of the government makes it so horrible in our communities that we're just trying to fight to stay alive, you know? And half the time we're self-medicating and with the, with the pandemic killing the flow of safe drugs, you know, we've got all this crazy chemical shit coming in from China, fentanyl, synthetic fentanyl, and it's killing people. There is a crisis here in, in, in the Yukon and in the Northwest Territories especially in native communities, people are dying by the thousands, you know, because they're trying to kill the pain, you know, and the opposite of, 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 of substance dependency is not sobriety. It's community. It's belonging to community. And so, you know, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before I throw in my, you know, next questions, Tina, do you want to have a response? Any other thoughts you'd like to add there? Uh, yeah, I think um, I think reparations is a really important part of reconciliation. I think that was, um, I think one hard thing about reparations, though, is I think is learning how to quantify our pain and put a number on it. I think that's an infinite number, and I think that's also a dangerous aspect of relying on economic in, um, interventions for for healing because it does have its limitations. Um, but I do, I don't understand how else people who are already barely making it on the margins are supposed to pay for therapy. Like, I feel like, of course, these 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 things are really important for us, but yeah, they're really inaccessible for, um, by and large, for communities. Or in my case, a lot of them are like for status people, you have to have a status card to be able to access certain services or certain communities, or even, um, <laughs> Clayton, you're talking about the, the Nietzsche elite too, you know, like sometimes I feel like the First Nation clubs are also really intimidating to have to bust through too. Like I feel like even coming from Thunder Bay and even in through my path and becoming a graduate student, like learning how to have a voice, 
when you grow up in a place that keeps a plastic bag over indigenous life is a really tricky thing to have to navigate. And I think like people talk about imposter syndrome. It's like, no, no, it's not that I'm shy that my dad's watching. It's like, I'm worried that Canada is going to have some kind of critique all the time of anything that comes out of my mouth. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's complicated. I do think um, the money question is really complicated too, because as soon as Canada witnesses a money transaction, it's, that's good. Or they can't think of the 60 billion is like the number that rings in their head and they can't really um, relate to how much that can't really accomplish because they don't really understand the, the depths of, of the terror and the violence and the trauma that we've survived that's in our, in our blood and our bones. So that's really a tricky thing. Um, that's why I think it's important not to let the state off the hook ever. <laughs> And yeah, I think the you mentioned also the um, the limitations of geography too, about how like there's reserve land and city land, and I think that's also a really important part to think about too. It's like these are imagined borders too, and I think our imaginations keep us like locked in these territories, and even in our land acknowledgments and our communities, we claim that we belong to a certain place, but also we forget like that we're also products of these contexts too that we have to really think about. Yeah, uh, just real quick on that, you know, I, I think we have to be more expansive. You know, when I talk about the money question, I completely agree with what you're saying, and I share the same concern. But I'm talking about, you know, you know, I mean, we have the comprehensive and specific land claims process in this country. And in most uh, provinces with the Natural Resources Transfer Act, We've got urban reservations as part of the, the specific land claims process, treaty land entitlement. And we have economic opportunities, um, you know, to create industry, to create um, textile manufacturing in response to climate change, housing, um, battery storage, wind turbines, photovoltaics, all of these things. We can do this in existing urban centers in our own tax-free business development zones. We have the capabilities to take care of ourselves as long as Canada stops freaking molesting us. Um, but to get that extra jump, to just to get to that place, we need that intervention right now. Um, we need Canada to honor its fiduciary and legal obligations. And we need um, Canada to demonstrate sound analysis in terms of just transition in regards to climate change. You know, indigenous communities, workers whose lives are dependent on the fossil fuel and other high carbon intensity sectors, these people need to be first in line to the new economy, you know? They need to be invested in, um, and the, the, the playing field needs to be leveled out so that they don't get lost through the cracks in the safety net as we transition and decarbonize our economy and as we implement truth and reconciliation. And, and, and I think most importantly, as we figure out the very complex and nuanced conversation of reparations. Oh, and and I would say that there's a really comp, the land claim stuff is, is, is really challenging and that's one of the most divisive things. You know, the, a lot of the modern day self-government and treaties that are being negotiated in particular in British Columbia um, are lifting up a, a concept of what's called a type of land ownership concept called fee simple, which is taxation, right? Giving up our right to non-taxation and becoming a part in the long term of the Canadian state economically. And we have to resist this type of um, this type of uh, categorization by the settler colonial state over our relationship in the context of our self-government and, so and sovereignty over our territories. Um, and I think it's really important that folks learn about this, especially Native people. If you read the readings, the writings of Arthur Manuel, the late Sequapmuk chief, the son of um, George Manuel, the founder of the National Indian Brotherhood, you will see um, that there is an insidious agenda when it comes to self-government and in, 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 in modern day treaty negotiations that's all about extinguishment okay of our collective rights and so this is very important stuff that we got to think about in this very nuanced conversation about land back and its relationship to truth and reconciliation 
Well, there's a Capion Barracks in Winnipeg too that went through the um, TLE process. And that, what was that like? Almost 20 years or something like that that took to happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's great. Uh, I, I, personally, on a just on a like as a citizen of, of Pugatawag and you know who lives in the city, you know, I, I'm frustrated with, with with that. I think that we have to have more vision as Indigenous peoples. You know, we don't need more hotels and malls in Winnipeg. We need to utilize that land to build up our our economic self determination. And we don't need to do that in a way that's refining oil or like, you know, exploiting communities or, you know, doing violence against Mother Earth through unsustainable industry. We can position ourselves as Indigenous peoples to, you know, create jobs, not just for our people, but for all Canadians in these treaty um, land entitlement regions like Kaipong Barracks and, you know, create manufacturing sectors, you know, because the, the, we're talking about millions of jobs here just to transition Canada off of fossil fuel and to, you know, uh, uh, retrofit existing infrastructure and never mind the building of new infrastructure to be climate zero carbon friendly, right? And, you know, the opportunities for us as Native people, um, you know, through this frame of reparation and through this frame, you know, because it's not just the government who, who owes reparation to the native in Canada. It's these companies, you know, these corporations too. They're not getting let off the hook. And it's the Vatican and all the other churches too. And we're patient peoples, you know, we're very diverse and different, but we're very patient and we're very strong. And we're going to be here and see this whole thing out. We'll be here long after Canada. So... You know, yeah, that's, I, I, I hope there's some really powerful things, visionary things that happen um, in the in the urban reservation there uh, uh, on Keniston in Winnipeg in Treaty 1. All right, I'm gonna jump in for one last question before we move into kind of the Q&A. We, we've been seeing some questions come in quite a few. So before we do what, one thing that we wanted to tackle was, was this kind of idea or thought about how, how do we mobilize our indigenous peoples, our groups together to come behind and support some of these things, given some of those challenges that exist from getting them to participate, getting them to a point to want to participate, to things say, you know, the right wing extremism push that we're currently seeing in Canada and other um, countries across the globe actively suppressing peoples and suppressing these movements. So I thought, what what is your idea? How could we best, yeah, mobilize this effort to put, you know, as you said, you know, get get beyond words alone and get action happening. I think that like the the two things that I think are most missing in so many circles everywhere I go are care and curiosity. I think that we're lacking curiosity about each other in a really intimate way. And I think intimacy is a very scary thing in this age of individualism. Um, ask somebody how they're doing and watch their eyes dance before you because they don't know how to answer a question in such honesty. It's so unexpected in such a fast paced world. Um, I think being curious about each other's lives, about our desires, about our lives, about what we're thinking about, what we're wanting, where we've been, um, I think just having conversations. Like the one thing that I take away from living in Northern Manitoba is sitting at kitchen tables with women and just talking our brains out about everything and theorizing and coming up with stuff and just, um, I don't know, being equal, right? Yeah, like it's so simple. And I think like um, we're just so busy looking at our phones or waiting for the Wi-Fi to kick in or trying to solve these huge problems. Like even I was in a, a social justice class and it's like, well, how are we gonna change things? It's like education and it's like, Okay, yeah, sure. Education is a huge umbrella that is really whatever. So like, we're gonna think about education for 90 minutes and get exhausted and never think about it again. What specifically little thing about education can we do in our world today? Or how can we educate ourselves or find little ways to break it down that make manageable steps? So I think um, we think about these Brigham Baller things and then we just go back to our phones. So yeah, I think just being curious about our situation, how things are making us feel. I think that's how we develop our empathy, some of us have forgotten our empathy for other people and um, just not being too proud to ask. I think like 
you know, that woman who was using it, the site at the library. We are all that women, that woman, but we forget that because individualism and capitalism has us like so far away from remembering our humanity and our desire to escape our pain, which is a universal thing. Um, yeah, I think just the, I don't know, even liberalism has this like, loves looking at itself in the mirror and thinking that everything's gonna be okay if we can just throw some more money at it. If I can do it, you can do it too. But it's different when you come from um, really different circumstances where, um, yeah, just your access to these things aren't equal. And even when you do get there, you're never gonna be the same anyway. So I mean, like it's 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 forever just a, a dead end for me. Um, it has to be something a bit more radical. And I think, um, I don't know, for me, radical kinship is really important in that way. And I mean, like Leanne Simpson talks about land as Aki and Anishinaabe, but also how it represents place, power, and relation. So how do you restore your place, power, and relation in your daily life and in your relationships? Well, that's a big question, you know, um, that I, 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 you know, it's like, how do we solve climate change, right? Yeah. Um, um, Whatever, whatever the answer ends up being, I do believe um, that it's tied to the sacredness of place. Um, and that's not just for the native, you know, that I think that everybody who lives in Canada needs to learn from their big brothers and sisters, their indigenous brothers and sisters. And even if you don't accept that, we are your big brothers and sisters. This is our land, you know, and we know how to take care of it because we've been watching it and loving it for thousands of years, you know, and all of the understanding of how to take care of not just our land and water, but of all of the circle of life that we share it with, you know, it, it lives inside of our language, which isn't written. And so the only way to convey that is to participate in ceremony, to go to gatherings, to learn the names of places in the language, to, you know, learn about the history of the people whose lands where you're raising your family is and to learn about the, the spirits of those those areas and to honor them you know in whatever way that you can right but i think fundamentally that people have lost uh, a way uh, a connection to a higher power whether that's kishimandu or god or um you know some sacred feminine entity or you know, the universe, or even just a tree that you really have a strong connection with when you hike in the morning to take your dog out. But people need to, you know, understand that, you know, in Cree cosmology, we have the winter spirit, you know, the cannibal spirit. And when there is imbalance, the cannibal spirit can possess you and, you know, make you eat your own fingers and lips and even your own family. And I believe that neocolonialism and, you know, colonization capitalism has released the winter spirit into the world in the form of this economic model that has literally changed the chemistry of Mother Earth in 200 years to a point now where in five years we're going to start to cease our ability to survive in certain parts of the planet because of our rapidly destabilizing climate. And so indigenous peoples play a critical and vital role not just for ourselves to save ourselves, but to save all members of the five fingered nation, because race is just a construct. Okay. And the only thing that makes us the apex species in the great circle of life that separates us from everything else are these little suckers right here. Okay. So we can pick up a mukaman and we can carve a spear and we can kill a Buffalo and feed a whole community. You know, we can, we can weave fishing nets and catch lots of salmon, feed our whole community. And um, so I, I, I think I think Tina hit it on the head there. You know, we have to keep it simple. And I believe that community self-determination is the pathway to economic, you know, sovereignty. And, 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 and I think self-actualization of community self-determination is the most powerful thing that we can facilitate um, through our collective effort to try and overcome the the really insurmountable odds that we face right now. Um, but there are tools available for that, you know? And I don't think that there's one big centralized answer. Just like Native people are not stuck in history, uh, you know, in a history book, you know, we're, things are never going to be the same again. 
you know, and we are constantly evolving because we were forced to. We are experts at adaptation, mitigating, uh, you know, massive crisis at migration on a mass scale. We're all environmental refugees, us natives that live in the city, you know. And so we know a thing or two about what the world is going through right now in the context of climate and never-ending climate-related conflict. And we can share with people how to move through that in a good way. And hopefully through trial and error, and hopefully in this generation, we can, through you know failing and getting it right from time to time, build enough of a big social movement to pressure those that are still holding on to power, the decision makers and the banks to finance them, to you know force them out of power if they don't make the right choices. Thank you so much for both for that back and forth dialogue. I have so many more questions, but I know that there are so many questions that have come through the chat. So I'm gonna pull a, a few up here. Um, the first one being, if you are familiar with this, was the forestry companies in New Brunswick returning land back to the Woola, oh, I always butcher community Woola names. Gonna, Woola Suck Nation, a step, Woola in suck. The re, step in the right direction. Do you have comments, either of you, on this one? I'll let you go, Clayton. Uh, well, big shout out to, um, to my, my dear Uncle Ron over at Willistook and to all the people there, you know, um, and, uh, you know, all everybody out that way, Elza Buktuk, Passamaquoddy in Maine, you know, um, the great Mi'kmaq Nation, um, you know, everybody that, that calls that part of the world home. Um, I think things are really screwed up over there in the Maritimes. You know, I think that the forestry company and in particular the pulp and paper uh, legacy issues of some of the mills out there um, have really screwed with the ecology and um, have been very violent markers and caused trauma on the people. Um, and I think that the forests there have been significantly decimated through monocropping, um, you know, um, you know, over generations. I mean, I think it's all third, fourth generation forest at this point, you know, which has created its own ecological crisis, which is going to take some time to heal. Um, I don't understand exactly what the agreements are between the forestry sector over that way and, and, and Willistook and other nations as far as returning the land back or, or, or whatever. Um, but again, like I said, you know, a big issue that we face is the recognition of the mobility of our rights. You know, you know, um, it was the decision, the Sparrow decision from out that way that gave us as indigenous peoples across Canada the right to harvest timber um, and, to, and to profit economically off of that. I believe it was Sparrow. Um, and so, you know, I think that that, that legacy, that victory um, is something that is meant to be built on, not just for Willistook and your specific circumstance, but for all First Nations. We just need to start doing these things. We just need to start milling our own wood, building our own infrastructure, taking care of forests and that stewardship, traditional ecological knowledge sort of way that has been passed down to us by our ancestors and just start doing it. You know, because the federal government of Canada can only manage with its police apparatus and its court system 29 or so conflicts, and then they lose, they cease the capability of control. And so if we escalate, you know, our, 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 our sustainable uh, economic activities in relationship to forestry, fisheries, and a number of other elements of, 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 of the future of our econ economy, um, economies, I think we can get it right and do something really powerful um, that restores balance um, between our, econ our economics and our sacred responsibilities to take care of the ecosystem as the apex species. I guess I would just like to add that I think um, I think it's really interesting to see that the way that industry is responding to land back in Canada. Um, yeah, that kind of scale. Um, at the same time, well, I mean, I mean, in the U.S. too, you know, there's a the mm -hmm. land trust that I follow, and they are really working on land rematriation down there in the San Francisco Bay Area, and what that means for them from a feminist perspective. Um, so that's really interesting work. Um, yeah, I think it's such a 
at the same time, industries are giving back land, but I think given the wealth of industry, I'm a little cautious of being too um, congratulatory over the act of return. Um, I think there's a bit of, um, yeah. Yeah, I think like my gratitude ometer is a little, you know, out of commission <laughs> after watching, um, you know, like I was at Center Block when the inquiry for missing and murdered and just women and girls was announced. And I feel like, you know, you have these moments of hope where you think things are going to change. And then years later, you see that um, they do offer some change, but it's just leave a complicated wake. So, yeah, I think it's good to be grateful, but also there's still more. And I think it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, I would take it a step further. I mean, fuck that. I'm not grateful for that stuff. I mean, I'm happy if, if Willistook has, has you know, less meddling in their affairs over their land, sure. um, especially by the private sector. But again, I want to encourage whoever asked that question, you know, check out Arthur Manuel's books. Um, yeah. You know, um, you know, Canada lost, um, um, it was one of the only times that, a, that, that, a, that, a, that a, you know, um, a government lost in the WTO secret tribunals over the, you know, it was over the softwood lumber tariff. It was a dispute between the United States and Canada and indigenous peoples, uh, the indigenous network on economies and trade intervened uh, as a, as a, as a friend to the courts. Um, and they submitted, uh, you know, um, comments um, that argued that forestry sector in Canada was was receiving an unfair trade subsidy by not recognizing indigenous or Aboriginal title um, in the in, in the harvesting of timber and the export of raw timber globally. That it was an unfair trade uh, subsidy and trade advantage. And the WTO ruled in favor of this indigenous intervention on this trade dispute between um, the two biggest trading partners under NAFTA. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, there's, these guys aren't giving nothing back. They've been straight up robbing us. Yeah. And I guess that's true too. It's like, thank you for giving it back. I mean, you're well, I don't know. Like, I feel like I just don't want to play into like the petting yeah. on the back. Like very well done. You did a good job there because also like, it's also not my territory too. So like for me to express gratitude from Kingston, like, yeah, I'm grateful that we're all getting it back, but also like, it's so much more than that. So mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a, a pivot question here. I'll put it up on screen from Dolly. If there was one thing our organization, in this case, the PSAC union, could do to be a good ally or accomplice on this issue, what would you suggest? Real quick, um, I just want to give a big shout out to PSAC uh, uh, reps, you know, there, there's a massive labor dispute up here in NWT. Um, you know, I, I, I bought a truck from my friends and went and drove around some of the big, big labor protest sites, you know, where workers are fighting for a good contract. Um, you know, the community here in, in Yellowknife has been really impacted by the fact that the kids can't go swimming and, you know, the, the, the library, you know, everything's been affected by this uh you know the, the this 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 labor dispute so you know i just want to express my solidarity with psac and their members um that have been taking action i hear rumblings that there's been a an agreement um that they've come to uh, together on so that's good news and i want to encourage you to keep up the good work psac um representing uh the brothers and sisters that make up your union um i think that you know um I think that the work that the indigenous uh, work um, PSAC circle does is really good, educating your members about these very nuanced uh, indigenous uh, rights battles that are happening across these lands they call Canada. Um, I know PSAC has a, a you know various um, social movement funding um, that you as a union can provide to frontline fights. Um, you know. And I, I really want to encourage you to provide those essential services like printing, um, you know, big mail outs, um, you know, uh, straight up donations to the front line of land struggles across the country. Uh, you know, keep educating people about the importance of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And certainly, you know, all of your locals, if you can continue to advocate in the institutions, in the cities where you are based, 
to adopt the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to adopt and implement in their own institutional way the 94 Recommendations on Truth and Reconciliation. This is very meaningful stuff. And certainly, you know, um, um, you know, using your 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 influence on, um, you know, the Canadian Labour Congress and the millions of workers that comprise that body, um, and right up and down the hierarchy of labour across the country, and your peers like uh, Unifor and QP, um, you know, encouraging them to do the same thing and not wait for an idle no more moment to do the right thing. You know, to do it every day. You know, you don't just have to talk about residential school and residential school day. You know, you don't just have to celebrate the native on, on the 21st of June. You know, these are things that need to be happening on a daily basis because in Canada, 87% of our population is white presenting. It's European settler presenting. About 6 or 7% are brown and black, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and then 5% first nations inuit and metis so until this stuff becomes a problem in the white community these problems are going to continue to manifest you know we don't live in a post-colonial context you know neocolonialism rears its ugly head every day in new forms it's the same story just different players so you know friends at psac um help us in that way I am a PSAC member, I'm proud to say, as a teaching assistant. So I I do think that um, unions play a great role. I think that um, mm -hmm. union flags are flown at a lot of Indigenous events and ceremonies and commemorations, actually, which is really interesting. Um, but in terms of allyship, I think um, in general, beyond unions, I think the question is really interesting because I think it's also um, a lot of, it's just, centers on indigenous people. Whereas I think like settlers or just white people in general don't think about their own whiteness very often. The question is always about like learning about residential schools, learning about all these issues and like, what do we want? And I think like um, whiteness isn't really asking itself what it's still trying to be and what it's hanging on to and what it's looking for in these kind of reconciliatory, you know, new age, new age, like kind of fancy um, parameters. Um, I think, you know, we got in this mess because Canada needed to construct the Indian and made these things to eliminate the Indian. So why don't we talk about why that happened and why that still happens today in our circles? And that's a question for, I think, each of us. And I think one that can be really only answered in the mirror before we kind of come to our communities. Because I think, you know, as soon as we kind of like know ourselves a bit more and know our own motivations, that's kind of, you know, the stronger person that you can bring to these kind of conversations. But yeah, I definitely think that, um, I know I often meet um, a lot of people who are white who ask me what they can do and how they can change things and what the answers are, but they haven't even talked to their friends about these things. So I ask, like, oh, why, don't your friends talk about these issues? Like, it's already on the news, it's on CBC, it's everywhere. It's like, no, we don't talk about it. So it's like, if you're constantly reifying your own whiteness and your own, like, privilege, it's going to be even more and more difficult to, um, to bridge that gap. I think, you know, it's it's really important too for for big labor you know psac and and, and whatnot to recognize um it's not just the native question you know we have a crisis uh, in our economy right now especially post pandemic with the emergence of exploited labor of migrant workers you know workers that are climate refugees that are refuge that are that are that are refugees from war um you know that are coming into our economy uh, through the temporary workers, foreign workers program, you know, all the produce in Southern Ontario and Southern BC, Abbotsford, you know, that, 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 that feed our economy and the global economy. You know, these are grown by, by Brown and black people that are brought in and exploited that don't have access to universal health care, let alone any health care or, or legal representation. Um, and, you know, the Trudeau government has made some massive promises to this community uh, uh, in regards to having status for all, and having access to fundamental uh, human rights, workers' rights, you know. And I, I, I send a big challenge out to all you unions, you know, to expand the pie. You know, don't just don't just be repping, you know, your your card carrying members. You know, we have to create space and status for all for these critical workers that, you know, are literally propping up the Canadian economy just as much as Native people and Native land and resources is. 
<clears throat> and paying and sacrificing their own lives because workers are dying in unsafe conditions. And so, you know, I think that the, the big labor has got to do better in supporting that and, and, you know, working with organizations and funding organizations like MigrantRights.ca, who's got a big rally in March coming up uh, on March 18th and 19th across the country. So I encourage you all to go to MigrantRights.ca, find out how you can plug in and support our, our migrant, uh, uh, you know, workers, brothers and sisters. And, you know, because I know for us as natives, we're the biggest demographic entering the Canadian economy in the next decade. You know, the boomers are all retiring. They're not having kids. And second behind us, as far as workers, you know, every quarter and every dollar of our GDP in the Canadian economy is about to be going to the most, two most marginalized populations, Indigenous peoples and migrants. And, you know, I think that a big solution to a lot of this stuff is solidarity, you know, amongst people whose, whose struggle and liberation is tied to one another. And I think that Indigenous peoples and, 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 and brown and black, you know, uh, uh, you know, folks across this country, we really got to band together as much as we can to make this a white person's problem, you know, because out of sight, out of mind, you know, with the 87% white presenting people who don't really even talk about white supremacy or colonialism or, you know, or these, these the militarization of our borders. Well, we're almost out of time. We have a few minutes left. And what I've been doing more lately through these dialogues is given the heavy topic nature, I'm wondering, is there something that keeps you motivated in this work? Is there something that's happened that gives you hope for the change upcoming in the future? Can there be change? Are we headed in the right direction? I know it's a stormy, it's a stormy, uh, um, you know, future ahead of us, but there must be something that, you know, guides you or gives you that thought and hope that it can turn around, it can be better. I think um, for me, it's almost revenge where I feel like after so much terrible awfuls that happened to you and like loss and grief, like at one point you just finally say enough, like, you know, and I feel like waiting for these answers and waiting for myself to feel like a true indigenous person, even though I'm non satirist or I'm lacking these things. I feel like, um, I don't know, revenge provides a vehicle for that tenacity to keep going. And I think, you know, I read this article by Beverly Jacobs and it talks about how like the violence of the state is replicated in our homes because the state keeps being violent towards indigenous peoples and it keeps apologizing and it normalizes this cycle of abuse and apology, abuse and apology. And then it, you know, in our homes and our personal relationships, like abuse and apology always happens, even, you know, you don't even think it's an abuse thing. And um, I think if um, for women who may be familiar with those kind of relationships too, at some point you do have to walk away from it and build something different for yourself when it all falls away. And so I think in the same way, I think about the state, like what if I walked away from what the state's telling you what an Indian should be or what land back is or isn't or what a woman is or isn't. And what if I got to define it for myself? And so I think like every day, you know, Leanne Simpson talks about building your world. And, you know, that's that's a big labor every day of like transmuting all this bullshit that's inside our tissues every day and making it, you know, aiming it at the state or aiming it at something. I think um, to balance that there, you know, you do need to maintain that tenderness inside and that love for your nation and um, for your people and for your land and for where you come from, wherever that is. Um, yeah, that's the fuel I have. And that's the hope I have too. like, it's just, there's got to be something different. And there's got to be something written that somebody can look and read in the future that might help them. I don't know, that's what gets me going. Yeah. Um... I lived my whole life, um, my adult life, you know, as a as a as a elite global campaigner fighting evil people all day long. And I used the, this this like really dense, you know, ball of hatred in my stomach for all the horrible violence, you know, that I experienced growing up as an individual. And <clears throat> and then I became a father. And, um, you know, and I, 
and working from a place of hatred and vengeance, it fit, it, it, man, I did some cool stuff in 20 years, but I did find that if you use it as your fuel source, as your primary fuel source, I think that it's okay to have righteous rage and even to have righteous revenge, never mind, you know. I'm actually, I'm a writer, eh? so I've been writing a lot of stories about that kind of Quentin Tarantino style, natives get revenge type stuff, you know, because I think our people need that outlet, you know. Yeah. But, you know, there's a there's a song I used to be an MC and there's there's one verse that I really always love and it, you know I, I say uh, the greatest act an activist can deliver is to raise the children in a healthy home so they can live a healthy life with moderate strife make it so that they don't fear the night proud to live a legacy children grow to honor your life and um, you know so I'm very motivated these days you know because I found that working from a place of hatred and, and anger it started to cannibalize me from the inside out and I turned to the alcohol and I turned to the drugs and I disassociate you know and all those things that come with trauma and you know and, and now that I'm 45 um, and, and my boys are teenagers uh, I want to live the next you know, the rest of my life working from a place of unconditional love. And I just want to love, you know, especially our people all across these lands that they call Canada. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the both of you for participating, engaging. I thought we had a wonderful conversation. And there's something that I think I bring up in almost all my, my chats now is Something that came out of the, again, the Yellowhead Institute, they released a report and, you know, we always hear this question, when will it be enough? And I really love the answer they shared. Well, it's going to be enough when the systems of oppression don't exist and our communities are living these healthy, prosperous, you know, lives that we want to be living. Why can't we have that? Why is there so many barriers set up for us to, to stumble over? But with that... Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our, our time here in our discussion. And on behalf of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, I want to thank both Clayton and Tina for joining us here today. We are working to engage in NCTR dialogues every month. And so please, please stay tuned for the future NCTR dialogue coming up in April. And I hope to see you there. With that, hi, hi. Thank you. And I'll now be closing up the broadcast. And before I do, uh, thank you to everyone who put in comments, questions. We love to see that engagement, even if we're not pulling it all up on screen. We are seeing it here in the back end. So thank you again. Use your language. <laughs> be curious. <laughs> even if it's just the swear words. Care for each other. 